Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is right at the top of the hour, and we are going to be underway here very, very shortly. My name is Dan Worry, and welcome to the Hunt Institute's Early Efforts webinar series. We're going to give it about 60 seconds for people to get logged in, but invite you to go ahead and begin using the chat. Uh, enter your name and tell us where you're from and introduce yourselves to the audience. Chelsea, thank you for that note. It looks like we're having, I, I don't know what, we've been having some issues with the chat here. We will uh, hopefully get that enabled here in the next minute or so. So stand by on the uh, on the chat and we ought to have that going. About, about two minutes after the hour, why don't we go ahead and uh, kick things off and again, want to welcome everybody to uh, the Early Efforts web series. My name is Dan Worry. I'm the Senior Director of Early Learning at the Hunt Institute, which is located in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, the Institute is the creation of our founder and namesake, uh, four-term North Carolina Governor Jim Hunt, and we serve as an education policy resource to governors and state lawmakers and other senior state elected leaders uh, covering the full spectrum of education policy from prenatal through uh, post-secondary and, and workforce. But here on this particular series, which we call Early Efforts, we focus on the earliest part of that continuum, the years of early childhood. Before we get started, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Again, we will work on uh, getting the chat resolved. A little bit later in the hour, though, we are going to have the opportunity to pose some of your questions to the panel. So as those are uh, coming to mind, I encourage you to use the Q&A function, uh, which I can tell is uh, uh, is functioning uh, at the bottom of your uh, screen there on the Zoom toolbar. If you could um, reserve the Q&A function for actual questions for the panelists, and that way we're able to sort of uh, separate out what is uh, chat within the audience and what is a question to be posed for the panel, but definitely encourage you to do that in the Q&A. Also know that today's session, like all of our early efforts broadcasts, is closed captioned. And so if that is a service that you would find helpful, uh, you can access the closed captioning controls also down at the, uh, the Zoom bar at the bottom of your screen. Finally, a question that we get uh, frequently, in fact, I've had a couple times already about this very session, a uh, question of whether this is recorded and will be available. All of our webinars are uh, recorded and are uploaded usually within 24 hours or so to the Hunt Institute's YouTube page. And so if you go to YouTube uh, and just search the words Hunt Institute, you'll find our account and we'll be able to access not only this broadcast, uh, but all of our other great early efforts uh, webinars and uh, other programming from the Hunt Institute. We encourage you to check it out as you're uh, driving or uh, going for a jog, and uh, you can access all of these uh, all of these great programs. Today is the third and final part of a special series that we have been running this summer in collaboration with the Bank Street College of Education, for whom we are so, so grateful, uh, on the early childhood workforce. And so I am uh, privileged today to be sort of sharing moderator duties with my uh, friend and colleague, Emily Sherrick. Emily, I uh, want to give you a chance to uh, say hello on behalf of Bank Street and maybe uh, set up a little bit of today's conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. And thank you to everyone at Hunt for having us here today and partnering on this exciting series. Um, for over 100 years, Bank Street has focused on how children learn and what teachers need to help children succeed. Um, and help learners of every age to reach their full potential. We know that high quality learning experiences are essential for fostering healthy child development. With this in mind, quality standards and assessment tools can be used to promote deeper understanding and inquiry about interactions and learning. But we also know they often have unintended consequences in both design and how they are used can often undermine our larger goals. Unfortunately, we know that these systems often take a one size fits all approach and don't recognize the vast diversity of needs and differing definitions of quality throughout the country and also across cultures. They're also often unnegotiated, designed by a few and don't recognize the experience and voices of providers and families. So we brought this panel together today to interrogate the ways we define and measure quality 
and at the same time to highlight some effective strategies for building more equitable systems. So I wanna thank Hunt again for organizing the last in this three-part series together with Bank Street and to all our panelists today. We hope that through these discussions, we will continue to raise awareness about the needs, but also opportunities we have for working together to build a stronger investment in our early childhood workforce. So Dan, let me pass it back to you to introduce our panelists for today. I think you're on mute, Dan. Someday I will learn. So uh, anyway, thank you, Emily, and thank you to uh, all of our great panelists who are here. Happy to introduce them, uh, beginning with Maki Park, who is a senior policy analyst at the Migration Policy Institute. Dr. Alex Figueres Daniel is a uh, research assistant professor and bilingual early childhood education senior policy specialist at the, Inst the National Institute for Early Education Research, or NEAR, at Rutgers University. Also, Dr. Sari Gupta, who is a senior researcher at the Strauss Center for Young Children and Families at the Bank Street College of Education. Also want to mention Dr. Stephanie Currenton, uh, who is the executive director at the Center for the Ecology of Early Childhood Development and an associate professor at Boston University is slated to join us, maybe experiencing some technical difficulties. So hopefully we can get Stephanie uh, on the line and uh, square it away here in the next couple of minutes, but we'll go ahead and kick off our conversation. And Maki, want to want to start with you as a, as a senior analyst at the Migration Policy Institute, as Emily mentioned, you have done some work sort of interrogating these, these quality rating and improvement systems uh, and looked at their impact on diverse providers and on the diverse children that they serve. Give us some examples of, of uh, these QRIS uh, indicators, maybe that support diversity and equality versus some that, uh, that you've identified that may be more detrimental. And uh, what advice would you have for, for system leaders about the design and the usage of these quality rating? and improvement systems, uh, given your research. Yeah, thanks so much, Dan, for including me in this conversation. Uh, I really love this question because I feel like it really opens up an inquiry into how our early childhood systems are organized and how they might be better structured to really center equity as a baseline principle. Um, and QRIS is such a powerful concept because it really tries to standardize and kind of make a blanket statement about what constitutes quality in an early childhood program, as Emily just said. Um, and I think it's so important that we understand that quality can mean very different things to different people and different communities. And I think in many cases that QRIS was just not necessarily designed with this reality in mind. Um, so one thing this brings to mind for me is a key area that we've been raising up in our work at MPI which has been around the importance of home-based childcare and especially family, friend, and neighbor care or FFN care for immigrant and dual language learner families and other families of color. So the narrative around FFN care has largely been that it's kind of care of last resort. I've seen a lot of messaging out there about how if we don't solve the childcare crisis, families will be forced to use FFN care and that this is really something to be avoided, implying that this is all low quality care. And we really want to challenge this framing and lift up the reality of FFN care being the most commonly utilized form of care across the country and disproportionately so for immigrant families. And that this is not only because they can't access other more formal types of care, though that is also true. Um, this is also because FFN care is where immigrant families can find the kinds of caregivers that they trust, caregivers who speak their language, caregivers who reflect their cultural values and share their worldview and likely their views about good parenting and responsive childcare. Um, and these are also caregivers who are more likely to be able to accommodate irregular work schedules and be responsive to family needs in this way. So I really wanna underline how crucial these elements are when families think about what constitutes a high quality environment for their young children. This just is what quality means for so many families. And yet even gaining entry into QRIS is so challenging for many home-based um, providers and especially FFN providers, just given the way that it's structured. These providers bring so much crucial diversity into the early childhood workforce. This really is where the diversity is. Um, and so many FFN providers speak languages other than English and are immigrants themselves. But these same providers are inadvertently left out of important quality improvement efforts, and many of them are unable to access the kinds of resources and the kinds of supports that could help them and the children in their care to thrive. 
And then on the flip side, what we don't see prioritized in existing QRIS instruments is this emphasis on the need for language access and cultural responsiveness. I don't think that anyone believes that a family could have what is considered a very high quality experience with an early childhood program if no adults in that family can communicate with any staff in the program. And yet language access and linguistic responsiveness are not baseline indicators of quality in many state QRIS systems. So, so what does that really mean for these families? Um, so really I see two sides of the QRIS issue. One is how it works to effectively serve diverse families, but also how it's designed to meet the needs of diverse providers. And of course, these two ideas do go hand in hand, where the more culturally and linguistically diverse our early childhood workforces, the more likely parents and families are to be able to find care that suits their needs um, and is in line with their identities and what they would consider to be quality care. So I think there's a lot of room for us to be thinking about what we can be doing differently to make these providers, many of whom may not speak English well, may not have reliable internet access, may have limited formal educational attainment, and may also be unauthorized. What are we doing to welcome these providers into the system to recognize and reward the important work they're doing with the diverse families they serve, and really just lean into the work of building the diverse workforce that we want to serve our communities well. Um, I think there's an opportunity to rethink how QRIS centers this existing workforce that's serving our most vulnerable families instead of seemingly ignoring their existence in many ways. Um, and I know we'll have an opportunity to talk more about forward-looking possibilities later in the conversation, so I'll, I'll stop there for now. Maki, thank you so much, and I, I want to acknowledge it as we're looking through the through the chat. Sometimes, sometimes we can get uh, so used to our acronyms and things. So I want to uh, uh, clarify: FFN is Family, Friend, and Neighbor Care. Uh, so, rather than using, for example, a, a for-profit uh, center-based child care program, uh, you know, uh, making arrangements with family, friends, and, and neighbors. And again, QRIS is quality rating and improvement systems. These are the systems that states have uh, enacted to uh, ideally measure the quality of the child care offerings uh, as, a, as a, a tool for parents to be able to, uh, to assess uh, where they'd like to select. Also want to uh, acknowledge here, looking through the chat, it's always exciting to me to see the reach that we have here. Uh, welcome. We have uh, comments from both Ethiopia and South Africa uh, in the chat here today. So it is, uh, it's, it's exciting to me to see the, the global uh, reach that these conversations are having. Alex, let's, uh, let's transition to you and your role as a bilingual uh, early childhood education uh, senior policy analyst at NEAR, you focus your research and professional development efforts on different dimensions of quality for dual language learners or DLLs. Uh, can you talk more about what you have learned about the strengths of maybe the workforce in this area and what more needs to be done uh, in terms of uh, measurement tools in particular uh, that can serve as both an, uh, an aid to uh, helping uh, progress, but maybe maybe sometimes also uh, stymies uh, some of the progress in this conversation. Hi, yes, thank you, Dan. And I'm also very excited to be here, um, particularly, I guess, um, because some of the, the most recent work that I've been doing has been with um, a particular group of Latina uh, educators here in New Jersey um, and in in effort to really bring their voices um, to places of decision making capacity. And so I'm excited to be here um, to share a little bit about what I've learned in my work with them in the past few months. Um, essentially, I guess my biggest learning is that even in places where we have the capacity um, to use language and culture in very asset-oriented ways, we're not. Um, in these um, particular communities where I'm working in New Jersey, we're lucky that we have um, quite a diverse set of um, preschool educators who do share language and culture with the children that they're working with. Um, but what I'm finding in my recent work through interviews and focus groups, is that um, while, while there is the opportunity to use assets like you know, a home language or to draw from cultural um, shared experience kinds of things, um, that we're not doing that. And largely it's because teachers do not feel supported or even know that this is permitted. Um, and in some ways I think um, 
while they're they're very helpful to working with children um, and utilizing some of the strategies that we would hope to see, um, these are really coming from places of um, in, intuitive, an intuitive nature on behalf of the teachers um, to support children's social and emotional growth, um, and largely so that they can protect children from having the experiences that they felt they had um, in their early childhood and elementary school um, years. And so we're, there's, a, there's a lot of space um, to develop um, ongoing and professional learning opportunities that allow teachers to feel that their assets and cultures are, are, are definite important strategies that we could be bringing into the classroom. Um, I'm further finding that without policies and systems to support this in ongoing and systematic ways, um, that there leaves lots of questions um, to the folks on the ground to figure out. Um, for example, I find that teachers struggle to figure out how much and when to use children's home languages, even when they have the capacity to do so. Um, and so there's um, there's a, at the moment um, never there's never an opportunity for us to be taking stock of what's happening in classrooms and to build systems that really help to capture what's happening and build on that um, for more. And we know from the research that these are things that should be happening. Um, in fact, uh, while slightly old, the the Mirrors uh, State of Preschool um, yearbook. Um, most recently um, showed when looking at dual language specific policies that really only about 12 programs have policies that require that staff have any specific training um, or qualifications. Um, and so in, in my work and, and with Mir, um, we have developed um, a tool that in some ways starts to look at this. Of course, policy will, will be helpful to really create um, systems. Um, but the classroom assessment of supports for bilingual acquisition or the CASEBA um, was developed on our part to start to be able to, to do justice, to take stock of what practices and strategies are happening in the classroom with the intention of really um, looking at practices that both um, develop English while maintaining a home language. Um, in my case, it's typically Spanish that I'm looking at and working with Spanish speaking educators. Um, and and there's a and, and there's a counterpart of that which really focuses on the self-reflective nature of ongoing professional learning that allows teachers to be agentic and making um, decisions as professionals about how they want their practice to grow. And so in in this most recent work, um, teachers are really grateful for having tools that really can support and validate what they're doing when they're doing the things that um, that they find evident there. Um, there, there is room, I think, um, on a whole, um, to be thinking about incorporating tools like this into systems that, um, that can really bring up um, teachers who have these kinds of linguistic and cultural assets and who, who are the diversity that, that, that represents the, the children that we're working with. Um, and so I think there's a real opportunity here um, to really think about it. And, and in that work, one of, I think, the most exciting pieces is that through use of these tools, um, we've really been able to show programs um, how important it is to have professionals and um, workforce that are diverse um, and really honor what they're doing in the classroom because all of a sudden it's something that we're looking at um, and, a, and a piece of their program that they can be proud of. Um, and so the tools allow some of that to come through in ways that other more global um, measures that we're typically using do not. So I'll end there. Alex, thank you. Sorry, why don't we, why don't we turn to you for a, a moment. As a senior researcher at the Strauss Center for Young Children and Families, uh, you have worked to move beyond some of the implicit bias that may be reflected in different aspects of school structures and systems and in these quality measurement tools that we've been discussing. And in particular, you have extensive experience using uh, the inclusive classroom profile as a tool for research and also uh, supporting reflective conversations with educators in support of strengthening their own inclusive practices. Speak to us a little bit about the ways that systems might better promote inclusive practices as they are seeking to define and, and incentivize quality interactions in these early childhood settings. 
Um, sure. Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to do that. Um, and thank you for including me. I'm, I'm so happy to be here with everyone talking about uh, how, we can, how we can support the early childhood workforce. So yeah, I think this is a great question. I think this is the million dollar question that we're trying to figure out. Um, you know, no two systems are alike. Um, so I think one thing that we need to think about is how we can create um, a structure to empower the connection, the shared ownership, the collaboration, and the reflection that inclusion really requires. And that kind of brings together all of the pieces um, that you were asking about, Dan. So um, I'm gonna, I'm, I think when we're thinking about systems in general, I mean, we might be talking about programs, we might be talking about schools, we might be talking about districts. So um, what I'm planning to share really can apply to all of those things um, and, and, and building, you know, what really, what the culture we need to be able to support what inclusion um, should look like within particular systems, given their needs and, and the diverse um, children and families that it's serving. So I think number one, systems really need to begin by defining high quality inclusion. So what it means, how it can look in practice, how children with and without disabilities benefit and, and what's needed to make it work within that particular system. I think that starting point is often overlooked but it's really critical in ensuring that everyone's beginning on the same page, that everyone's speaking the same language, that we're talking about the same outcomes, particularly if we're talking about inter interaction quality. Um, I think a second thing that systems can do is create a collaborative community for inclusion. So um, for those who are familiar with the practice, inclusion is an ecological approach, which basically means multiple people and components are need to be in place across each level of the system for it to work. So an example of, of, of a component that requires cross-level coordination within a system is teacher planning time. So teachers need and want time to be able to plan with each other and to be able to plan with families. Um, they are often not in a decision-making capacity where they can allocate that time for themselves, but districts can create priorities or policies and administrators can provide support for that time. I think then what we need to do is create interactional participatory spaces where people can come together across levels to really come, you know, check in, ask questions, share knowledge and ideas and reflect on experience. That together can reinforce the community effort that's really needed to support inclusion. Um, these spaces can also help everyone involved identify areas of strength, areas of improvement, um, but also just build accountability and shared ownership for inclusion, because I think that's really important. Um, we're all working together to be able to do it. It can't, it just, like, inclusion really just can't happen in isolation. Um, a third thing I think systems can do is, is promote professional learning around inclusion. So assessment tools, which is what, you know, we've been talking about here, um, can invite ongoing reflection on practice when they're used in that manner. So right now we're conducting a mixed method study in New York City um, on preschool inclusion. And we are using the inclusive classroom profile, which was developed by Elena Sakaku. Um, and essentially it assesses the quality of teachers inclusive practice. And it does that by looking at 12 key practices, not just looking at the environment, but also looking at the quality of interactions within the environment, how families are engaged um, in the process, how children's learning is monitored. So those are just some examples. Um, now, the tool itself provides a numerical rating in each practice area and a final score about quality, but what we're choosing to do with it is um, share observational data and then engage teachers and administrators and families in reflective dialogues about the practice of inclusion at these sites. And so the aim of these conversations is really, you know, we're helping um, everyone who's involved learn how to look at data, notice patterns, consider the influence of contextual factors, but the idea is really to identify strengths as a community about what's working well, what issues are popping up, what questions they have, and ultimately that can help individuals um, you know, identify areas where they can continue and improve the quality of their practice, whatever that might look like. Um, and I think finally, you know, from a systems perspective, like teachers are really the frontline implementers of inclusion and incentivizing the ongoing reflection it requires is really important. So I think. When we, when we consider um, inclusion as an ongoing learning experience rather than as a checklist of things that need to kind of get done on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we're really creating that culture in which inclusion can thrive. I think another big part of that is inviting teachers to celebrate their positionalities. So what I mean by that is how teachers identify 
um, you know, whether it's culturally, linguistically, from an ability, um, disability perspective, um, what personal and professional experiences they bring to their practice, and, and really supporting their individual needs. I think all of that can go a really long way in retaining teachers in a, in a field that, quite frankly, um, has been understaffed and largely ableist. And I think this framing can really, you know, looking ahead to the future, attract a more diverse cadre of people who maybe don't have the formal training for inclusion just yet, but are deeply committed to improving outcomes in young children and families and, and just need some help to get involved and get started. Um, and, you know, with that support, financial, professional, um, they can really, you know, be part of that, of that conversation and that practice. Sorry, thank you. And I want to welcome again everyone to enter questions that you may have for the panel down in the Q&A function in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to those here a little bit later in the hour. But before we do, I want to welcome in Dr. Stephanie Currington. Stephanie, it's great to have you with us. And um, you know, we're as we're talking about these these quality measures, I know that you are currently working uh, on, a, on a new tool, the ACCESS, which stands for Assessing Classroom Sociocultural Equity Scale, uh, that was designed to assess the classroom experiences of racially marginalized learners. So uh, tell us a little bit about why, why the scale was created and how does it differ from some of the other uh, commonly used uh, quality measures in the field? Sure. Um, thank you all for having me. I apologize for um, popping in. I have um, a sick child that I was tending to. So I'm happy to be here in this space and be able to talk with you all for this time. Um, so I am here to talk about the, um, the access measure and um, that was designed to specifically look at the experiences of racially marginalized learners in the classroom. And um, the reason why I developed this scale is because um, I feel as though we need as the as an early childhood community to really acknowledge and recognize that our system is flawed by racism and classism in its very design and its very core. And so the only way that we can really fix that is by being brave enough to confront these flaws. Um, and we, if we wanna do that to create a system that is racially equitable, we have to start focusing on racial equity in terms of access, in terms of quality, and in terms of the workforce. So I'll spend a lot of time talking about measurement of quality specifically, but I think that the measurement of quality in and of itself will not sort of help change our system. So we need to also think about these other aspects. So if we could just spend a few seconds to, to talk about access um, to early care and education, what we know is that um, Latin Latin children in particular um, have less access to early childhood center-based care. And we also need to talk about how segregated our early childhood systems are. So our early childhood systems are actually more more segregated than our K through 12 systems across the country. And, and we all know that there's huge problems in our K through 12 system that are related to segregation. So we are allowing those same problems to exist in our early childhood space. And then in terms of quality, we have to be honest and start talking about the fact that racially marginalized children do not even have the same access to high quality. Right. And then, of course, in terms of thinking about the way that we commonly define and measure quality, which is what we're here to talk about today, I think that you can um, look at the body of work um, that my colleagues and I have where we talk um, about we have a paper that describes the access measure, but we also have a book that sort of looks at these questions of um, what is quality and what is racial equity in our system um, overall in our book called Don't Look Away. And um, the re reason why I created the access tool was to look specifically at racial equity in the classroom. And it's my hope that the access tool can be used to measure the experiences of racially marginalized children in particular. And um, it's it may be the first measure of its kind to really try to fuse together what we know about developmentally appropriate practices in early childhood with the literature on culturally responsive pedagogy and anti-bias pedagogy. And so I just thought we that the field desperately needs a measure like this. 
um, because it can provide us with information about the educational quality, specifically as it relates to racially marginalized kids. And once we know this information, then we can begin to build the professional learning community that is needed to help teachers learn and grow in their practice. So I've spoken about this idea of teachers being able to learn and grow before at other national um, conferences, such as the BUILD conference in the summer of 2021. And sort of anytime I have an opportunity to speak, I like to talk about um, how the access tool is really a tool that is focused um, at the heart of it in terms of how to learn, how to grow, how to change um, practice. Um, and we are just now starting to see, because it is a new tool, we're just now starting to see evidence that um, a teacher's access scores in, turning, in terms of how racially equitable a teacher's practices are, are really associated positively with children's um, outcomes, specifically their math and their um, executive functioning skills. And we've seen this across several studies. And so this gets us, lets us know that we need to start thinking about quality in a different measure, in a different way. We need to start measuring different nuances of quality. And when we do that, it can work, meaning that we can see changes in children's um, growth. And then lastly, just in terms of the workforce, um, I think we um, have to talk about sort of how we break down um, racial equity in terms of the workforce, in terms of really acknowledging that there's an overrepresentation of women in color, women of color in the workforce, and that there's a huge pay disparity that is quite shameful. So when we start to think about quality measures and quality tools, I think it's just really important for us to think about these tools embedded in a larger system that is striving to become more equitable in and of itself. Stephanie, thank you. And Emily, I'm going to pass things over to you for maybe a few more questions for the panel. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for also bringing us back to a bit of a bigger picture here. You all have offered great examples of better measurement tools, stronger approaches to measurement. And I'm struck by something you said, Stephanie, which is measuring quality itself won't change the system. And I appreciated, sorry, your comments around using evidence and data collected through um, different tools for reflective professional learning. And all of this, of course, comes um, at the time where we know systems leaders providers are struggling with recruitment and retention. And that's a real reality um, in our system. So if, if we can think about like, how can these quality systems and measurement tools be designed to retain and support our current and diverse workforce? How can we move away from a more punitive, punitive approach and a punitive system to one that truly supports learning? Um, so let me ask each of you to sort of think about that question and, and Maki, maybe I can start with you. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I, I think I mentioned earlier the diversity that we see in the informal workforce, which I think touches really nicely on where, where Stephanie was ending with this issue of the early childhood workforce really being highly stratified by race and ethnicity, which I think is something that's widely known, but just not yet appropriately addressed. Um, and what I mean by this is that you, as you look across the spectrum of the early childhood workforce, you see that workers of color and workers who speak a language other than English are far more likely to be working in these lower paid positions that require lower qualifications. And that diversity becomes more and more sparse as you move up towards center-based care and preschool teachers or directors. So I think this question of retention is, is such an important one. How can we retain the diversity that we have in the workforce? and also develop a realistic career ladder that allows early childhood workers who have invaluable skills and experience to move their way up in the field so that what we see when we look at the workforce is a more equitable picture. And I think there are opportunities beginning at entry into the system. Um, there's so many barriers that can prevent workers and providers from registering and from accessing subsidies at all, despite the work that they're already doing as providers language barriers, bureaucratic barriers, and unwelcoming culture for those who may be uncomfortable interacting with institutions, um, as well as policies that prevent those who are unauthorized from gaining entry. So we can be better prioritizing the accessibilities of these processes. So simplifying paperwork, conducting outreach to communities, providing basic translation and interpretation services that are currently lacking, meeting people where they are. Um, and of course, that continues into thinking about career advancement as well, and the ways that workers who may have limited English and limited education are able to gain the credentials and qualifications they need to make their way 
by supporting them in their full lived experiences through integrated pathways to advanced education. Um, and I know that could be the topic of a whole separate conversation. Um, but yes, I, we also need to be centering equity when we talk about professionalization of the workforce as well. Thank you, Maki. Do others have thoughts and want to chime in on this question? Sure, I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, when we think about our QRIS system um, in general, um, I, in my opinion, our QRIS system should focus less on ratings and more on sort of a cycle of improvement. And we're starting to move towards that. Even the way in which people talk about um, QRIS systems has changed in the sense that people are now talking about QIS systems instead of quality rating improvement systems. And I think our systems need to think about how we create the opportunity for the workforce to learn and grow and expand their skills. That's the heart of, of these rating tools that we wanna use in the system is that we wanna use them um, to help us learn how to grow and change. And originally, of course, our, our quality improvement systems were very much focused on this sort of quest to find the right rating tool. So we've spent the last say 20 years trying to find the right rating tool. But I think we're starting to see a shift from rating tools to more of a focus on how the system is built in a way that will reinforce this continuous cycle of improvement. And that this means that ongoing improvement efforts are now going to be the key driver of these systems. And this really, um, when I talk about this, I really, um, Harken back to a quote that my colleague Deb Mattis at Build said, and her quote is that professional learning for our early childhood educators and leaders is the driver of any of this quality improvement. So it has to really be at the heart of it. And that's very much so why I said that when I originally set out to design the access tool, I thought about how will this tool be um, taken up, you know, in the community and how will we be able to build the supports that teachers need, you know, around this tool so that we can learn and grow and become, um, come be become better. Alex or sorry, do you wanna uh, jump in on this? I think you're on mute. Lesson for me to learn. I do that all the time. Sorry. <laughs> I, I was just saying, I, I agree with what's been said. And I, I also want to take a step back and, and take a look at teacher preparation, because I think a big part of learning how we think about quality, look at quality, um, can be developed in teacher preparation programs. And, I, and, and it doesn't have to be the traditional model of teacher preparation. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, in introductory classes um, that teach teacher candidates about what inclusion is, exposing them to different types of um, quality instruments that are available out there, giving them a chance to try them out, and then teaching them um, in either coursework or different types of experiences, how we have conversations about what these tools are, are gathering, what, what kind of information we're gathering, how we structure that conversation, and how we can actually have conversations with families, with um, administrators, with each other um, in ways that are um, productive and not you know, kind of that punitive or evaluative, um, that, that, that piece I think is what we wanna get away from. Um, I think the obvious way to do that is to have high quality um, settings in which teacher candidates can go into and see what high quality actually looks like with respect to some of these practices. But in the absence of that, you know, it's, it, I think it really is about how we structure the conversation and how we can do it in such a way where we're not just, you know, assigning a rating to it. It's where was, where was the missed opportunity here and what can we do to really promote this type of interaction or um, improve the setting in such a way that children are not just being given access to the classroom, but are actively participating, fully participating in morning circle, for example. Um, I think those are the, the conversations that um, I'm, I'm not seeing enough of, but I know our, our teacher candidates have been hungry for um, in learning how we communicate and, and kind of you know, talk the talk of inclusion and quality and, and, and get on the same page of how we can you know, 
get toward a place where we can talk about improvement. I guess I'll just add to to build on what everyone has said, um, but in thinking also about um, professional learning and that that need will never go away um, to really think about more intentional planning of professional learning to to be connected. And of course, this would this would feed into a reflective cycle like uh, Stephanie was talking about. But um, just from my experience, I know teachers feel that professional learning is very disjointed, that they have one thing coming in at them one day, another thing coming in another day. And so I think the more effort that we can make to ensure that um, topics and concepts are, are really um, presented as intentional and part of a larger kind of overarching goal, whatever that may be. Um, and I think to lots of teachers who I work with who say, you know, they're, you know, in particularly in public school settings, you know, like we're doing this this day. E equity at least is not something that you do for one for one year or and so the more I think that we can develop these more um you know overarching and ongoing um efforts that get at all of the different um concepts and topics that we want to be, you know, working with teachers on. Um, I think it's reassuring because I, I think that while we need to focus on um, helping, you know, teachers want to stay um, as a teacher, as, as a having been a teacher, for me, this is an important piece, right? If you feel like you're constantly, there's a, a moving target and you're constantly trying to change what you're doing, um, that can be very frustrating um, in addition to all of the other responsibilities and um, stresses that that bring, uh, you know, that a classroom position might bring. And so um, to that point, and particularly thinking about um, our tool at NEAR, it's been very important for us to think about um, the purpose of the tool and whether it's for the purpose of research or evaluation or accountability, for example, or professional learning and self-reflection. And I think um, that's, um, a, you know, sort of related, but, but definitely important um, uh, point to think about in terms of um, not, not overburdening um, teachers and adding to stresses that, that may um, feed into um, turnover. Thank you. Um, throughout today's call, folks have talked about the diversity of the workforce and the importance of both acknowledging, including, and also supporting our diverse workforce. Um, but too often when we build these systems and then also think about the connected um, policies, we default to assuming a traditional classroom environment. Um, so I'd love to think about um, how both the measurement tools, but also these connected systems and professional learning opportunities can be adapted or designed to more explicitly include a range of providers, um, especially as Yumaki mentioned, you know, when we think about infants and toddlers, it really becomes the majority of our workforce that's in um, different settings. Stephanie, do you want to kick us off for this one? Okay, yeah, so um, I think this is a really great question. And I think that this um, highlights another problem that we have in the field, because we tend to um, avert our gaze or to gaze so much at the center-based preschool program and everything else kind of gets blurred. And um, which is not smart of us to do as an early childhood education community because we have actually more children that are younger and out and older outside of that age range and then we also have more children that are being served in other um settings outside center-based um programs so i think that some of the ways that we can start to solve it is be by really incentivizing um, researchers and developers to create tools within these different settings, right? So um, if we look at our structure, our, our what's um, being funded in terms of research, what is being um, sort of um, encouraged to be um, done in terms of um, just research at, in general, it's always this center-based early childhood programs. And so I think that we need to start to um, 
to, like I said, incentivize scholars to create more tools in this um, area and this aspect. I know one of the things that was a, um, a hard but very welcome lesson for me when I was working with the Head Start program in um, California, the Wu Yi program, which I love and have been working with for the last several years. And we were um, um, training some of their staff on how to use the tool. And the staff, you know, let us know that this tool that I had really designed for, you know, center-based like pre-K kind of um, settings was not going to cut it. And they really pushed me and encouraged me to think about how can we, you know, for at this point for us in our project, think about how we can modify the tool just for us to do in this product project, but it also led me to thinking about on a more conceptual level, how we would measure um, culturally based racial equity quality in early in infant toddler classrooms, as well as in family child care classrooms. And I'm just beginning to do that work as a scholar. And I think that others along with me should be incentivized to do that kind of work. Do others want to add to this? I unmuted this time. <laughs> uh, I, I think I I think I agree, and I also want to add that incentivizing districts as well to be able to invite. Um, you know, I'm going to go back to teacher preparation because that's kind of where I live. So I inviting one of the struggles that we all, we often experience um, in preparing teachers is finding sites where teachers can spend time and learn about um, programs for infants and toddlers, for example. Um, so if if they're not getting the opportunity to be able to even learn about what that looks like across different settings, how can we even begin to have conversations about what quality um, looks like within those systems. Um, a lot of times, you know, we don't have those partnerships because um, programs for infants and toddlers are at their maximum, you know, level. And the people who are the providers who are working in them are, they just have so much that they're working on that taking on a teacher candidate and teaching them about quality across settings is, is really difficult. If there's a way to provide for districts to maybe or programs to incentivize partnerships with institutions of higher education where, um, you know, researchers, um, people who are preparing teachers can really go in and examine and look at what quality looks like. I think we can start that conversation at an earlier stage before teacher candidates, you know, even get into the field um, so that they're kind of framed and thinking about what it looks like. Um, and then, you know, when that's coupled with what Stephanie is talking about, we've kind of got this like approach where we can kind of come at it in two angles where we're bringing people into the system who are thinking about quality, but also incentivizing researchers who are actively working on what quality looks like through different measurement tools. So I think it's, you know, it, it can't just be like a top down, bottom up kind of a thing. It's really got to be um, addressed on in different ways um, that feed into the system and really can benefit children and families um, in, in that manner. So I think that's what, that's kind of where I would I would see there be. Sorry, thank you. And we are uh, about 10 minutes away from the top of the hour and uh, have some great questions uh, lined up here in the chat. So I thought we would spend uh, just a couple of minutes here uh, fielding some of those questions. In fact, sorry, you uh, gave a little bit of a, a written response to one question, but I want to want to revisit this question from uh, from Gwendolyn in the chat that um, certainly uh, pertinent to the to the ICP and Stephanie also to the access. Um, Gwendolyn's noting, and maybe I'm uh, uh, editorializing a little bit on her question, but you know, frequently when we use these quality measurement tools in, in classrooms, um, they, they may be more useful in terms of deriving a score than they are in terms of you know, kind of what do we what do we do next? And so Gwendolyn is asking in the chat, you know, once these tools are used, uh, what's next? Is there a corrective action plan that is suggested or some sort of technical assistance that might go along to help classrooms uh, make that shift? Um, so I'll just say that I, I was lucky enough to be coming in, like I said, after 20 years of watching us sort of um, 
do this wrong, where we developed, we discovered a tool and we built our whole system around like a few tools. And, um, and so when I was creating the access, I was very intentional about sort of what is that technical assistance framework that would need to exist in order for people to learn and grow based upon the results that they have, you know, for that tool. One of the things that we're actively trying to do now is work with, um, uh, smaller programs across states and in cities um, to help us think about what what that sort of professional development and leadership coaching would look like, you know, um, across our systems. So that work, is, I think, is very, very important. And I think the other point that's important, too, about these rating tools is that we need to be intentional about how we give people um, the information back from their rating tool. So we don't want to give it back to people in a bunch of scores, because then people will just think about the scores and the numbers instead of sort of the processes that they should think about changing and ways that they should grow. So I think that um, that's another way in which we need to move forward um, from what we've done in the past. Sorry, anything you want to uh, share about the ICP? I'm sorry. You did it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, so I can speak about um, you know two different experiences. One, it, in particular, working with a with a program. Um, I, I think one of the things that I do as a researcher when we're thinking about you know action plans for inclusion and quality is I I'm I don't know the system as well as the people who are actually working within it. So I'm really coming in as a partner to help them identify areas where they want to grow um, based on where they're you know, really interested in improving inclusion. So um, the, the, the term corrective action plan kind of uh, makes me uncomfortable because I really want, like Stephanie said, to help programs identify um, where they can improve. So an improvement plan is probably more along the lines of what I would, I would use, but we, um, rather than providing observational, you know, the, the actual scores, for example, of quality, we can provide that, but we really want to engage um, teams in the process of looking at the data observationally and just kind of looking for patterns and helping them work through like what this, what this means, what this, does it, um, align with what they thought they were doing, you know, like what does that whole practice of, of reflection actually look like and data review actually look like so that they can kind of draw their own conclusions about what is working and what isn't working. So our approach is really to um, come, at it, come at it from more of an empowerment um, perspective um, and just kind of help them work through that so that we can identify areas that they want to improve and then put in that technical assistance piece and help them develop that piece. So I'm not sure if I answered the question. I feel like I talked in circles, but hopefully that helps a little bit. Definitely good. Another another question from the audience for, for Maki, sort of Maki, circling back, I think, to where we began the conversation about family, friend, and neighbor care. Um, how do we move away from the idea that family, friend, and neighbor care is considered low quality? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. It's a big question. Um, I think it really is about creating a narrative shift. And how do we do that? I mean, I think it's really about redefining our understanding of what quality means as we kind of started this conversation with, you know, it's about rewarding language match and rewarding culture match and placing a real value on rootedness in community and culture and making that foundational to our idea of quality, not like a nice to have at the very top tiers of quality, but really a baseline need to have to focus on equity. And that means, yes, in the design of QRIS and other instruments. But I think another part that's often lost in the conversation is the need to bring these providers and impacted families to the table and having a more diverse policy conversation and also advocacy table. Like what kinds of voices are we really hearing when we're talking about policy change and what kinds of voices are being privileged? Um, so just really grateful for this conversation um, and an opportunity to really raise this to the top. Absolutely. Great equity question from uh, from Albert at the Alliance in the chat as well. He's saying that they're hearing from state advocates that there are challenges with access to special education services for preschool age kids, especially when they are served in early childhood settings that are outside 
of the public school system. Anyone on the panel have suggestions for how to address this inequity? I think uh, uh, I, I, I can give it a, a go, but I, I, I think a lot of times programs that may struggle with that piece, I just wanna pull up the, the question so that, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the question. Sorry, I, it, it may be in the answered um, tab. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think this is this is a common challenge that we're hearing about. I think um, this might speak to the capacity of a program to be able to effectively include um, children with disabilities. In other words, do they have policies in place that welcome children with special needs? Do they have folks on staff that um, are prepared or have the training to be able to do, um, to practice inclusion? Um, do they have that skill set? And so I think um, finding out more about what some of the um, challenges are, or what, what's really preventing that partnership from happening, I think is a, is a first step to being able to answer um, the question. So, um, Without that, it's not really clear. Um, I don't want to provide a blanket, you know, solution for how to address the inequity without really understanding what the challenges are within that specific system of being able to serve those specific children. Um, I have a, a little comment about this, and this comment comes more from my, you know, experience, my lived experience, as well as some of my knowledge um, as a researcher. I think that. When we look at our um, the legislation and the program and how it's delivered in general, when we think about IDEA, it is very much a school-based centric. It is not a interdisciplinary um, program. There are problems with how that program even works with the medical community. And sometimes children have medical needs. Um, and so I think that you know, one of the things that we need to do in order to sort of um, help create a system that is more equitable in that way is really start to push back on the advocate community, the research community, you know, et cetera, the, prof the professionals, the pract practitioners, um, per push back on them to help them start to see this, um, this, these services as something that need to exist in a child's life, even outside of school. Um, and so, and I think, and until we, you know, sort of step up and sort of lead them in that way, I think they're going to continue to think about this as sort of a school-based issue and just try to address it within the walls of the school. But I completely agree with you, Albert, it's the inequities are rampant. Alex, Sandy had a, a comment really in the, the chat that I'm going to help turn into a, a question. She's talking about the, the challenges of hiring multilingual uh, staff and that, you know, that sometimes what states are experiencing is, is a lack of translation services or even a prohibitive cost related to translating, um, in some cases, even like the college transcripts or other sorts of uh, professional development that some of those multilingual uh, or potential multilingual staff members have had. Um, and and the, therefore, maybe there's a lack of willingness for the state to really evaluate and accept that sort of documentation. In your work at NEAR, are you seeing states that are, are tackling that, um, that problem or have any suggestions for how how they might go about making this uh, problem uh, less a problem? I have not, um, but certainly something worth pursuing, I think. Um, and as um, as states generally are looking to increase um, teacher teacher spaces, um, certainly something that we should look into. Um, I know in it, 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 and partly it's it's perhaps even sharing within a state what one corner of somewhere is doing with another. I know here, at least in New Jersey, we have pockets of areas where there are lots of bilingual teachers and other areas where there are none. Um, and so perhaps even um, thinking about ways for, for people to have um, shared conversational spaces about how to start thinking about that um, may be a place to start, but I'm not aware of, of any place that's, that's doing it um, more systematically. Definitely a, a challenge. 
Well, we are right at the top of the hour, unfortunately. It always uh, always flies by faster than we want it to. I want to take a moment to thank all of our panelists today. Maki Park of the Migration Policy Institute, Dr. Stephanie Currenton of Boston University, Alex Figueres Daniel, who is a, a assistant professor and bilingual senior policy specialist at NEAR at Rutgers University, and Dr. Sara Gupta of the Strauss Center for Young Children and Families at the Bank Street College of Education. This has been a, a fantastic conversation, and Emily, uh, a fantastic series of conversations over the course of the summer. I want to just uh, say uh, what, a, what a, a delight it has been to partner with Bank Street on this special series. I hope that there are many more opportunities for us to connect in this way in the future. Likewise. Thank you, everyone. And I, I would do, I, we would be remiss if we did not mention uh, Lily Rosenthal of, of Bank Street and Becca Hanlon of the Hunt Institute, who have really led the behind the scenes work on this series uh, this summer. We are uh, so, so lucky to be connected with them both and to be connected with all of you. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to make this conversation a part of your afternoon. Hope that you will join us. We'll be back on Tuesday, September 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern time for a conversation about the state of the American childcare industry. We'll be joined by Michelle Kang, who is the new CEO at the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Dr. Lynette Fraga, who is the CEO at uh, Child Care Aware of America. And Lanet Dumas, uh, former executive director of the National Association of Family Child Care Providers, now with Pharrell Consulting Group to uh, have a really robust conversation around the needs of child care providers in the nation. So we hope that we will see you on Tuesday, September 6th. Until then, it's great to have you with us, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.